On behalf of the American Statistical Association, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion with Professor George Box of the University of Wisconsin on his experiences in the development of statistics. This videotape is part of the American Statistical Association's ongoing program for the filming of distinguished statisticians. The purpose of this series is to capture an historical perspective, the personal recollections, feelings, experiences, and opinions of those persons who have contributed so much to the development of the theory and practice of statistics. Dr. Box was born in England and did his undergraduate work in chemistry. It was while working as a chemist on laboratory experiments that he became interested in statistics and the design of experiments. His formal education in statistics culminated with a PhD degree at the University of London in 1952. He also holds a Doctor of Science degree from the University of London and an Honorary Doctor of Science degree from the University of Rochester. He was head of the statistics group at the Dye Stuffs Division of Imperial Chemicals Industries in England in the mid-1950s and came to the United States as the director of the Statistical Techniques Research Group at Princeton University in 1957. He moved to the University of Wisconsin in 1960 and founded the statistics department there. Few persons have had a greater impact on the use of statistics in science and engineering. Dr. Box is the principal architect of advances such as response surface methodology and evolutionary operation. He has also made many significant contributions to time series analysis, robustness, inference, and other areas. In each instance, his contributions were stimulated by practical problems. He has published more than 110 research papers and is the co-author of six books. The importance of his work has been recognized by major awards from the Royal Statistical Society, the American Statistical Association, the American Society for Quality Control, and the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Statistical Association, the Royal Statistical Society, and the American Society for Quality Control. He has also served as president of the American Statistical Association and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Dr. Box's work has resulted in many significant contributions to the use of statistics in industry, particularly the chemical industry. His work on response surface methodology and design of experiments is standard operating procedure for many scientists working in research, new product development, process improvement, and manufacturing. His evolutionary operation technique has been used by many companies to improve process yields and reduce costs. Statisticians and other scientists and engineers are indebted to him for his extensive writings, consulting, lecturing, and short courses on industrial statistics. Dr. Box is also known worldwide for his pioneering work with the late Dr. Gwilym Jenkins on time series analysis. The Box-Jenkins approach, as it is fondly referred to, has been found useful in the modeling and control of industrial processes, economic forecasting, inventory management, and in the analysis of environmental data. We are also pleased to have with us today Professor William Hunter, who will lead our discussion. Professor Hunter is also at the University of Wisconsin's Department of Statistics. He has a unique view of Dr. Box's work, having worked with him on a number of research projects beginning in the early 1960s. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and we look forward to your discussion. George, how did you get started in statistics? Well, Bill, I was uh, originally studying chemistry, and then in, uh, in September 1939, the Second World War started, and I went in the Army the following month, in October. And uh, I was, you know, doing, I was in the engineers doing various things that engineers did, and I was still stationed in England, and then they discovered that I knew something about uh, uh, chemistry. And um, so I was posted to a place called Porton Experimental Station where there was research going on in what to do about people who were gassed and so forth, chemical warfare. And uh, that was a problem because uh, actually there were air raids going on over England pretty regularly and it was thought quite possible that gas might possibly be used and then there would be the question of what you did you know, about it. And uh, so um, 
So I was doing these chemical determinations. I was a lab assistant. I was working for a man called Columbine, who was uh, then a major, I think, afterwards became a colonel. He was a physiologist. And um, we had all this data on these animals, and it was pretty variable. And, and uh, I happened to say to Columbine one day, uh, you know, that what we really needed was to do some statistical analysis on this data. And he said, yes, I know, but we don't, there isn't a, you know, we don't have a statistician and we can't get one, we've tried. He said, what do you know about statistical analysis? And I said, well, nothing very much, but I have, I did read a book by a guy called Fisher called Statistical Methods Research Workers. I didn't understand it, but I read it. And so he said, well, you read the book, so you better do it. And uh, so I found, you know, myself involved in, in analyzing, well, designing and analyzing experiments. And I continued to do that for about, th about three, three and a half years after that, at that place until, in fact, the war ended. But um, uh, since I really, uh, what I did actually was I wrote to the army people, the army educational people, and I said, uh, can you help me to get some background in statistics? And they sent me a reading list, and mm -hmm. I've always, you know, yeah. What was in that well, list? That was a curious thing because um, I I've never really understood who, where the reading list came from, but I'm suspicious because all the books were Fisherian. There was uh, the list I think was uh, statistical methods, research workers, design of experiments, Fisher and Yates's tables. There was a um, several American books, but they're all by people who are sort of disciples of Fisher. There was a book by Lindquist on, on Fisherian methods applied in educational research, a book by Donald Mainland applying statistics in medical research, um, a book, Chapman and Schumacher's book on um, f uh, uh, sampling in forestry and range management. There was Golden's book, which I found very useful in experimental design, and uh, Snedekor's book. I was also, the only book I had which uh, was anything to do with, or books I had anything to do with statistical theory was Aiken's little book and uh, Tippett's book. Well, you must have uh, been stumped at times where you had problems, the answers for which weren't in these books. Well, I, no. What did you do? Well, I was, and I can remember one picture occasion when this happened. Um, we had a, um, a pathologist, uh, Professor Cameron, uh, who happened to uh, be interested in mathematics, and I used to talk to him from time to time. And in particular, he was interested in the history of mathematics and all these history about them, about mathematicians. And um, I happened to be looking at some data one day and looking apparently pretty sad because uh, this was time mortality data, mm -hmm. and these graphs should all have been parallel. Of course, they were, I was plotting against the pro bits, and, and they should have been straight lines, they should have been parallel, and they should have been complete data. But in fact, they weren't straight lines, they weren't parallel, and I had missing data because uh, some of the animals didn't die. And I showed this to Cameron, and I said, I don't know what to do with this data. And um, Cameron said, you ought to go and see Fisher and consult him. And, uh, you know, I would, I would imagine if somebody had said you should go on and talk to God or someone, I would have felt about the same way because... But he, but he said, no, Fisher is a very approachable person, write to him, and so I wrote to him. And uh, he said, um, yes, uh, uh, send me some of the data and come and see me. And, uh, but then there was this big problem because in the army I was... I think I was a corporal or something like that then, and I was, for, for, for discipline, I was under a, uh, an artillery unit. And uh, they couldn't figure out how to send a corporal to Cambridge to consult a professor. And so in the end, they made up a story that I was going to deliver a horse to Cambridge, and uh, that way they could make up a proper railway warrant and everything. And uh, so I, I got there in the morning, and I saw Fisher, and. He was extremely kind to me, and... Well, what happened? Well, he, he said, well, it was a lovely summer's day, and he said, you know, and this was in Story's Way at Cambridge, in his house, and he had a, 
a, a, a, an orchard and he said let's go out and sit under a tree in the orchard and he said you look up the the probits and I'll look up the reciprocals and it wasn't until that moment that I realized we were going to make a transformation or well, we made the reciprocal transformation of course all the lines came out to be parallel and, and um, they came out to be straight or more or less straight and uh, the only thing left was what I would do with these the um, censored uh, data so he said well he said there, there shouldn't be any problem about that you'll find I wrote an appendix to a paper by by Bliss about that and so I had all my problems solved <laughs> <laughs> did you ask him about anything else well I was there? yes I was worried because I really didn't know any I mean I, I was doing these things but I really didn't know what I was doing I didn't know anything about the statistical theory at that point and, and I, I, I said, well, I really don't have a book on statistical theory. And so he said, well, uh, here's a book you can have. And he, he produced uh, volume one of Kendall, which I still have with his name in it. And said, uh, and I said, you mean I can take it? And he said, oh, yes, take it. And so that. <laughs> uh, after the war, when you got out of the uh, army, what did you do? Well, I thought by that time, I was quite convinced I wanted to become a statistician. And uh, so I went to University College, as that was at the end of 1945, to ask if um, I could come and be a student there. What was the uh, uh, admission procedure? Well, there wasn't really any admission procedure. I mean, uh, what happened was I went, I was interviewed by Egan Pearson. And uh, uh, I remember it very well because um, I spent most of the time telling Egan what a wonderful man I thought Fisher must be and uh, he listened very patiently to me for about half an hour and then in the end he said well uh, you can come uh, but he said there I'd like to tell you one thing there were one or two other people who did something in statistics besides Fisher <laughs> uh, were there uh, lectures in the summer times no, there, there weren't any lectures in the summer. Uh, I had begun to think that, you know, with my background, in, original background in chemistry and statistics, that I might like to go into the chemical industry as a statistician. And um, there were vacation jobs to be had, and, and I, got, I applied for a vacation job in the summer to go to Imperial Chemical Industries. And what did you do there? Well, that first summer, I, um, I was at headquarters in, in, in London. Uh, there was a statistician there called Mr. L. R. Connor. But what he was mostly worried about at that point was this uh, book, which got to be called Little Davies, which was um, Statistical Methods in Research and Production. And um, that the, they were going over the galleys and correcting the galleys and making some changes in those. And I, mm -hmm. I helped with that. And that's about all I did the first year, but I, apparently I uh, got a good mark for what I did because the next year they, uh, uh, I got another vacation job, but this time I went to a division where they were actually doing things, and that was Dye Stuff's division up in Blakely in Manchester. And um, actually I was allocated there to a testing lab, and uh, they were running all these tests on um, vinyl plastics and rubber and so forth where they were taking these samples and they were pulling them so many times to see how many times they pulled them before they broke and they were rubbing things against standard emery paper to see how many revolutions of the machine it was before you got a certain loss in, in weight and a certain abrasion and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, and so I was having a great time uh, because, because I'd, at Porton I'd run you know, all the standard designs pretty well and I liked to do, I had to do um, some nice uh, factorials with confounding and all this thing. So I was having a great time with these machines because, you know, there would be a machine with four positions, for example, so that and you want to compare several different kinds of samples. So you'd be using, well, you'd be using Latin squares and Newton squares and incomplete block designs and things like that. And um, then also they wanted to run things when they had factors involved, so they'd run factorials, but then you couldn't run the factorials in, in, in extensor, you had to run them in small blocks, and so you got some nice mm -hmm. uh, things in partial confounding and things like that. Yeah. Was your research work at, uh, uh, at 
University College influenced by your work uh, at ICI? Yeah, it was because, um, <coughs> well, in particular, uh, you know, I was quite worried about these these things where they they kept pulling things until they broke because obviously the distributions involved were, roughly speaking, the distribution of the weakest link. And uh, assuming the original distribution of links was normal, the distribution of the weakest link wouldn't be, it'd be highly non-normal. And so I wondered whether these tests they were doing were, were really uh, appropriate. And uh, another place where I wondered about the appropriateness or the robustness, if you will, of the procedure to these departure assumptions was where uh, they would take a sample and they would uh, find the where after a thousand revs, 2,000 revs, 3,000 revs, and so on. What we These now revs call re being revolutions. revolutions of the machine. Yeah. So it's sort of repeated measures design. Well, obviously these things were all correlated, and uh, and they were running analyses of variance on them as if they were independent. So uh, sometime, you know, what, two of the things that I, I did, um, well, that were quite, uh, some of the things that were in my thesis were really quite closely related to those questions of what happens when the assumptions are not valid, and uh, yeah. and in particular trying to uh, those, those at that time I used to believe much more than I now do in testing hypotheses, so testing hypotheses of the adequacy mm -hmm. of the assumptions and so on. Yeah, what did you do then after you finished at University College? Well. Uh, after University College, I was offered a job at ICI, so I went up to ICI, and um, there, um, one of the problems that uh, had been mooted to me already uh, uh, when I was still a student was the fact that they were interested in this problem of determining optimum conditions experimentally, and that there was a, 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 a chemist called uh, Dr. K.B. Wilson who had suggested a method for doing this uh, using what amounted to steepest descent, and I thought this was a, quite a good idea. Uh, there were some problems uh, associated with this because you've got really to determine derivatives uh, and, uh, you know, derivatives subject to the fact that the, the data was subject to noise. But I thought, well, this could be done using fractional factorial designs. And, um, in fact, we... Uh, we sought out um, some chemists who were uh, working in the lab and trying, I mean, they would start off with some route to a chemical which they wanted to explore, and then they would try to get the yield up. I mean, they started out, I started off with a yield of, say, 20%, and they know probably that by finding the right conditions, they could get up to, say, 70%. And the question was finding a way of getting up there fairly quickly. And we found that, um, these methods of Stevens descent did that and got us up to the answer. So you were working quickly. very closely with uh, Wilson and these other chemists. Yes. In doing this. Yes. A chap called Kenny and another chap called Yule were involved too. And then this must have led eventually to this uh, uh, publication with Wilson. How yes. Did, how did that happen? Well, um, there was a sort of preliminary to that, which was. Um, that uh, a friend of mine, I think it was, uh, I think it was Yule, who said, you know, George, if this stuff is really going to be shown to be of any real value, you know, we've got to get some manufacturer, well, not let's just play around in the lab, but get some manufacturer, a full-scale process which is running, and run some experiments on the full-scale process and so that you can improve it. Well, so we, we found, he found such a process, and after a lot of uh, difficulties, we managed to get people to agree to run some, make some runs on the full scale. And uh, we ran a design, it was a very simple design, it was a two cube factorial with a point in the center, and so it was just nine runs, but they were nine runs on the full scale and they took a lot of uh, effort to get those made. They were not particularly large errors in those runs, but I was distressed when I came to analyze the runs. What? Well, what did you see in this, in the data? Well, um, you know, what we'd hoped to see was, was large uh, first order effects, in other words, large first derivatives, which would then in, got us a direction of steepest descent so that we could have taken off into the wide blue yonder and improve the process. But in fact, all the first derivatives were very small. And the second derivatives, insofar as we could determine them, that's to say the two factor interactions, were all very large. 
and judging from what we knew the experimental error was, highly significant. So uh, it looked for a moment as though we'd failed, and then um, and I went away and thought about it, and I thought, well, what we really ought to do is to determine all the second derivatives, including the the uh, d squared y dx one squared derivatives, curvature oh, well, derivatives. What was Yule's uh, reaction to that? Well, idea? <coughs> when I when I said that to him, he said, oh, that means we'll have to run three levels, and that means we'll need 27, George. And I, I mean, it was hard enough to get him to do nine. I don't think you'll ever get him to do 27. And I said, well, perhaps we don't need to do 27. Perhaps we could just take our cube and put two points here and two points here and two points there. And, and that was the first composite design. But when we did that, I had no idea whether it would work or not. They wanted to know what to do, so... I, we said to do that, and they went off and did it. And while they were doing it, I actually worked out the inverse and so forth, and did find that it was seemed to be quite a decent design. And that was the way that came about. And then, uh, then the paper was published with uh, Wilson. Well, we, we heard from uh, I think George Barnard, who uh, or George Barnard heard about it and uh, suggested that we came and that we wrote a paper about it and presented it to the Royal Cisco Society. And I was very surprised because I, I, didn't, I didn't really think this was all that big a deal. But, but um, anyway, it was, we read the paper and, and uh, it went quite well. How did it happen that you uh, came to the United States? Well, that was really due for that, to that paper. My understanding is that Stu Hunter, who was then a student at, at, uh, at Raleigh, and uh, a student who was well known to Miss Gertrude Cox, he, um, uh, he read this paper about optimum conditions and he, he thought, you know, this is just exactly the kind of stuff I gather that he was interested in. And so he went to Miss Cox and said, hey, you ought to get this guy over here. Well, um, an, another person that Stu knew very well was Frank Grubbs, and Frank Grubbs had uh, was uh, worked for the army and he had quite a lot of influence with the army he was a statistician there and um, so between the three of them um, they uh, and also Bob Hader got in the act and they cooked up a contract which included me to come over to the state so I just got a letter saying will you please come over and be a visiting research professor at a North Carolina State College out of the blue and I asked uh, ICI if they'd give me a year's leave of absence, and they said, after some deliberation, they said yes, and they actually paid my fare to go over and come back again. And we went on to Queen Mary, I remember, that was very nice. And what, uh, what research did you do in, in North Carolina? Well, of course, when I got to North Carolina, I was introduced to Stu, and, uh, and we worked together on... Uh, on more about response services, in fact, about rotatable designs and so on. And, and um, but then there was another uh, student there, and I think Bob Hader said, uh, well, you know, we'd really like you to take another guy under your wing, George, and that's uh, Sig Anderson, who actually is a, I believe still does work here in DuPont. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but, uh, I did, well, what Sig uh, worked on was um, more on this robustness stuff and its relation to randomization tests and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we had these two kind of projects going on, optimum, can, well, response those methods with Stu and robustness with, with Sig. Now, when did you get the idea of uh, evolutionary operation? <laughs> well, um, I remember that because it was, I had an old car which I paid two hundred dollars for, and, and I'd driven up to Kingston to the meetings up there. Then that year I was here, and um, we went on a trip, a Thousand Island trip, which was on the lake. And uh, I remember it very well because um, we we landed on the American side because the the boat we were in was short of gas. And there were all these statisticians sitting down alongside the boat. And immediately we got on the American, on the United States side, a, an immigration man got on. And he started walking down the boat saying, where were you born? And the first person he saw was, was Jersey Naiman, who said Poland. And I think the next person was R.C. Bowes, who said India. And the next person was me, and I said England. And the guy after that was Sig Anderson. He said Denmark. And, 
And then the next man was hoofding, and he said, Russia. And at that point, he said, get this thing out of here, get it right out of here at once. <laughs> but, but that was the trip where I was sitting next to Sig, and uh, Stu and I had been working on designs where the points were formed regular figures, dodecahedra and so forth, and it seemed to me that one way you could run a full-scale process not to get too far away from the point you started from was to run the works process in the center and then move out to a, a slightly modified process along this ray and then a sl slightly different modified process along this ray and so on and keep coming back to where you've been. And that seemed to me to be a good idea. That, that got changed eventually, but that was the idea and I actually told Sig about it at that time. And then when you returned to uh, England, you worked on EVOP. And what other things did you work on when you returned to ICI? Well, um, about this time, um, my friend Philip Yule was, um, we used to talk to each other quite a bit. He was a physical chemist. And uh, he was fascinated by the fact that as we were studying these processes and beginning to get some idea of what these maxima look like, Many of them seem to, you know, you think of maxima as being, you know, there's a point and there are these onion skins around it, so to speak, and sort of a symmetrical maximum. Well, maxima didn't seem to be that way at all. They seem to be just spread out. And you get a maximum along a line or, or a maximum along a plane, you know, where you could get a whole series of different alternative processes. Or you'd sometimes get rising, these, so these were ridges, you sometimes get rising ridges where if you change things to, together you could get increases in you. And he was saying, well, he was interested in chemical kinetics and he was saying, well, you know, this ought to link up with the kinetics and uh, this kind of ridge ought to imply this kind of kinetics perhaps or something like that. So, uh, so what we did was um, he postulated some sets of equa differential equations which would come from the kinetics and then we integrated these and then we were faced with the problem of fitting these by these squares to the data. And that got us involved in nonlinear estimation. And at first, this was about 1954, at first uh, we did it by um, minimizing the sum of squares uh, using sort of response service, as, uh, treating the sum of squares service like a response service and doing it that way. But uh, I soon came to realize that was inefficient. And, uh, and so we eventually worked towards what, event, what was equivalent to the Gauss method of linearization. Yeah. What were the uh, circumstances that brought you back then to the United States? Well, uh, I was back in England for about three years. And then uh, I, uh, John Tukey, contacted me. He, used to, he actually used to call me in early in the morning and, uh, and uh, he, da he invited me to come over to, um, to come and be the director of the Statistical Techniques Research Group at Princeton. And eventually I did. Who were some of the people who, uh, who were there at the Statistical Techniques Research Group? Well, well at different times, of course there was John Tukey and there was Martin Wilk. Um, who was the associate director, and, and at different times there were um, various people. There was Stu Hunter, Colin Mallows, Martin Beal, Henry Chaffee came as a visitor, Jeff Watson was there for a time, um, Curly Lucas came as a visitor from North Carolina, Gwynham Jenkins came, and Merv Muller was there for quite a long period. Yeah, what research did you uh, do while you were there? Well, um, I, uh, you know, I was continued to be interested in uh, in uh, this these topics of, of robustness. We I worked with Jeff Watson on some aspects of robustness in uh, in uh, regression analysis and um, randomization and the relation there, and uh, still interested with Stu Hunter in in. Uh, in, in standard designs and, and fractionals and so forth, uh, and in responsive designs, but, but also in nonlinear designs. And this in particular with Curly Lucas. When Curly Lucas came, we got together on working out things about nonlinear designs, and that was interesting. And I guess it was uh, near the end of your stay there that uh, Gwilym Jenkins uh, visited and what kind of problems did you discuss with him? 
Well, um, the way the way we got involved in time series analysis, is, or the way we got involved in our work in time series analysis, was interesting because I really got involved in it starting from, strangely enough, from experimental design. Really, I'd met in some of the consulting work I'd done. I met uh, a problem which went like this. You had a process, and uh, say the optimum conditions were thus and so at the beginning, and then as the catalysts, say, aged, or some circumstance changed in the process, the conditions which gave the maximum actually moved. And so you were, what you wanted was something which would actually chase the maximum. You couldn't exactly predict the way, that, how fast it was going to move and so on, and so you wanted a way of, of chasing it. And uh, a way that I thought of of doing this, and, and I wasn't the only person who thought of it, a lot of people thought of this too, a lot of other people thought of this too, but it was to put a, a sine wave into the, say it was the temperature that you were, uh, it, was, it was say yield against temperature, you could put a, a sine wave into the temperature and then look for the sine wave in the output. And of course if you had a, a positive first derivative, you'd get a sine wave in the output at the same frequency, which you could then um, extract by multiplying it by another sine wave at the same frequency and integrating the answer and feeding it into uh, feeding it into the temperature and moving the temperature forward or if it was on this side you get a negative relationship and that would feed it back and I was telling Gwilin I was trying to get the chemical engineering department to actually build a thing that did this and this was at Princeton at Princeton yeah. but I never had much success with them I mean we talked about it we didn't actually get it done but Gwilin said to me you know George if you're going to do that uh, you'll have to think more about dynamics of the system because when you start putting sine waves into things, you know, it's, it's in fact going to be some kind of tank or something and there's going to be this liquid and they'll get inertia in there. You've got to consider the dynamics of the system and, you, and you'll get phase shifts and all this you've got to take it care of. And also the noise won't be random noise, it will be correlated noise. And so we started talking about that. And then over, you know, gradually, I mean, um, over the years, uh, or months anyway, we came to realize, well, this is really a control problem, and so really what we should be, be getting ourselves interested in the control problems, and then really that in order to solve control problems, they're really aspect, they're just an aspect of time series problems, and so eventually we came around to time series, and we worked together on that. And you did about this time move to uh, Wisconsin, and you did join up with the uh, chemical engineering department there to actually build yeah. some equipment to do that. Well, Olaf Haugen uh, was, uh, was there in the chemical engineering department. He was close to retirement, but he was, he was still there. And he, um, and we got, you know, we, we decided to, to study this as a joint project. And uh, he found a nice uh, gas furnace, some ga a gas furnace reaction. It was, it was essentially burning methane to make CO2, which uh, he said, you know, the great thing about running something in the university is you mustn't make too much product because we can't sell the product anyway, so we were making CO2, which was a product we didn't have to worry about. And um, we actually, eventually, there was a couple of guys, Ken Cott, a couple of guys, Ken Cott now and Tony Fry, who were graduate students there, and they actually built one of these things and, and made it go. And some of that data is in uh, the book, Ox and Jenkins' book. Ox and Jenkins' yeah. book, yeah. The, when you started lecturing at uh, Wisconsin, I know you got interested in, uh, in Bayes' theorem. Uh, how did that come about? Well, of course, uh, you know, my education at University College had been very much frequentist theory and, and very on a non-Bayesian. In fact, I think even one of our lecturers had warned us against it as if it were the work of the devil. But um, when I came to actually lecture, I mean, it, it, when I came to Wisconsin, we were starting a new statistics department, and uh, there were so many things to do and so many courses to teach, and I decided I would teach uh, a course which the math department had had up to that time on the advanced series statistics. And actually, you were in the class, right. Bill. And, uh, well, I, uh, my recollection is it, and of it, and yours may be the same or different, I'm not sure, but was that you know, I did start off being somewhat of a frequentist, but the more I lectured, the more Bayesian I became. I mean, it just seemed to me that, gradually dawned on me that this made, seemed to me to make a lot more sense. And these problems I've been struggling with, which arose from the fact that, you know, most of the time that you don't have sufficient statistics and things like that, 
uh, really were non-problems as far as I could see, and they just arose from a mathematic, mathematical fluke which didn't bother Bayes' theorem at all. Uh, another student in that uh, class, of course, was George Tao. That's right. And then you worked with him. Well, uh, you, you know, he, was, uh, he, he went on from strength to strength, and a uh, good deal later, he, uh, we got involved together in all kinds of things, but uh, uh, we got involved in, you know, the robustness aspect of Bayes' theorem uh, originally, and then uh, in various time series problems, and then um, with analyzing environmental data. Right, and you did uh, start, uh, well, I guess you'd always been thinking about modeling uh, problems, but you started to think again of certain uh, problems with model building and, yes. and so on. Well, let me just say one more thing about this uh, environmental data. One thing that came up there was intervention analysis, because, um, you know, they, there was all this data from Los Angeles that we analyzed, and there, there were various changes they'd made in the law, like Rule 63 said, from this date onwards, it's illegal to sell gasoline of more than a certain hydrocarbon content in Los Angeles County. So we knew that from then on, there wasn't any gasoline of that type being, being sold. We had this highly seasonal, highly non-stationary time series, and we wanted to, to know if what, well, you know, if we could find out if that seemed to have made a difference at that point. And that turned out to be a very valuable technique. So that was one, another one of the things that came out of uh, some practical need. Now, these ideas came together in what might be uh, called a theory of modeling. Yeah. Well, Bill, you know, um, there were various ingredients in that. There was uh, the work we did together on uh, various aspects of modeling and uh, getting, you know, that uh, when you change um, when you change the conditions, the parameters should stay constant. That's the thing you worked on, and so on. And um, things like uh, discrimination between models, which I worked on with Bill Hill, and, and um, there were all these aspects. But uh, these were, to some extent, bits and pieces. And, um, and then there was this time series thing that we wor I worked on with Gwilym Jenkins. And, uh, you know, it became very clear, I thought, with the time series thing, that there, were, there was this sort of iteration going on. I mean, you were, on the one hand, you were saying, let's suppose that this uh, model form that we are considering is correct, and then let's use Bayes or likelihood to say what that implies about the parameters. And then turning around and having been a sponsor, turning around and being a critic and saying, ah, but just a minute, let's look at the residuals and so forth. It seemed to me there had to be, that was the way that models got built, um, with the added thing, of course, in experimental work, that depending on the, what you thought the current model might be and what you feared it, it might uh, be different from what you originally thought, you would... Um, have to be running further experiments and so on. So it seemed to me that this did, um, it gradually came together that this whole business of modeling was really encompassed in, um, in this, uh, this twofold iteration involving criticism and, uh, and estimation, and, uh, and uh, that, 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 that what we were really trying to do was make that iteration more convergent and more certain of convergence. Uh, one theme that definitely runs through your uh, career in statistics is working on practical problems and then that leading to theoretical advances. But it seems to me that one exception to that, well, the exception that proves the rule, if you will, is your work with David Cox on transformations because uh, it is true that the precipitating event that led to your uh, work with him on transformations wasn't uh, really trying to solve any practical problem, at least in the first instance. Isn't that right? Well, uh, the specific precipitating event, I mean, I suppose there are various events, but the precipitating event that, wrote, that led to the writing of the paper, as I recall it, was that we were both together on the research section of the Royal Statistical Society, which is the section that 
organises the the papers that are read into the to the to the research section, and um, people used to think it was odd that there were there was a person called Vox and a person called Cox on the committee, and they would say, um, "Aha, you know, you two people ought to write a paper together." And we, uh, David and I, heard this so many times. I think that in the end we said, "Well, maybe we should write a paper together." And then. I think we just said, well, what should the paper be about? And, and, and you know, Box and Cox is a sort of transformation, and so we said, why not transformations? And then we, got, we did some work on it, and as I recall, we got stuck. And then after, after some time after I'd uh, come to the States, I think David wrote me and said, you remember that thing we got stuck on? I think I can see a way around that. And then after that, we finished it off and wrote it. But I think, of course, that although that wasn't, that itself wasn't a precipitating practical need. I'm sure that in, in, in David Cox's experience, there are all kinds of situations where he found transformations were valuable, and I'm sure that was true. And it was, of course, true with me from the very beginning. I mean, ever since, I mean, I was, it was terribly dramatic to see when I told you about Fisher, you know, and sitting under the tree and drawing these lines that all suddenly became parallel because we'd made this reciprocal transformation. So, so I'd been fairly gung-ho on, on transformations too. Mm -hmm. um, looking back on your career as a statistician, what, well, what have you particularly liked about being a statistician? Well, I think two things, and, the, and they, um, they're related. Uh, I think that if I'd stayed a chemist, I would more likely be involved in a sort of vertical organization where I tended to talk to other chemists and so on, and perhaps only saw a rather narrow, uh, got rather a narrow picture of science. But in f I found being a statistician that one can get involved in all kinds of one, you know, doesn't mind one's own business at all. One gets involved in everybody else's business and it's sort of more like a horizontal thing. And I sometimes used to think in ICI I got involved in so many different departments that I sometimes seemed to know more about the company than a lot of other people who were involved just this way. In fact, I used to say, uh, Dr. So-and-so in some other division is doing some work I think is related to that and that was sometimes new to them. So that you get, you get to see all sorts of different things and you get to meet all sorts of different kinds of people uh, who are you know, involved in geology or, or astronomy or whatever it may be uh, and uh, that makes life very interesting. Oh, one final question. Um, what advice would you have for someone just getting started in statistics? Well, I mean, there are all kinds of different sorts of people, but, you know, speaking from my own prejudices, I, um, I really feel that there are all kinds of exciting problems to be solved, and that, you know, there are many places where I'm sure there are all kinds of exciting problems to be seen. Uh, the, you know, the Bell Labs, the Boyce Thompson Institutes, the, the um, Cotton Research Institutes and so on, those places and their modern count, more modern counterpart, I mean, well, some of those are still, of course, producing, but there will be new ones now coming up. Well, there's just a lot of problems are coming up and, and uh, problems that need to be solved. And I think that uh, there's certainly a very interesting life to be had to get involved in there in those problems, and I think that there's a lot of new the uh, theoretical problems will come out of that sort of work. George, I've really enjoyed spending this time together with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. <laughs>